Welcome to our webinar exploring how access to affordable housing can help New Mexicans, New Mexico and the nation combat climate change. I'm Kelly O'Donnell, Home Wisdom Director at HomeWise. HomeWise, which has offices in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, New Mexico, is a community development financial institution that helps New Mexicans achieve financial stability through successful and sustainable home ownership and helps improve economic vitality and small business opportunities through neighborhood reinvestment and revitalization. Home Wisdom, a project of HomeWise, provides data, insights, and policy recommendations to help advance affordable home ownership. Our webinar today will feature a panel discussion followed by 10 or 15 minutes of questions and answers. To submit a question for the panel, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Your question will be seen by all our panel members, but not the rest of the audience. The chat function is disabled for the duration of the webinar. So now let's get started. Climate change and the nationwide housing shortage are two of the most serious issues confronting the nation in 2022. In today's webinar, we're going to explore the role of residential real estate development in combating or contributing to climate change and discuss how increasing access to affordable home ownership can reduce our collective carbon footprint and create more sustainable communities. With us today to do that are some very knowledgeable New Mexicans representing a variety of perspectives. Tammy Feeblecorn is the city councilor for District 7 in Albuquerque. She has degrees in economics and finance from Northeast Louisiana University, as well as a master's degree in natural resource economics from Colorado State. Councilor Feeblecorn has an extensive history in energy efficiency, having worked deeply on energy efficiency program design and evaluation. She has worked on numerous projects, including funding and implementing low-income energy efficiency retrofits in disadvantaged neighborhoods, updating energy conservation codes, developing coordinated positions on energy and transportation cases at the NMPRC, and managing the Mayor's Energy Challenge, which helps Albuquerque small businesses reduce their energy burden and environmental impacts. In her role as the New Mexico representative for Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, Tammy works to reduce energy burden and transportation burden for low-income New Mexicans and pass policies that fight climate change. Camilla Fiebelman serves as director of the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club, which represents over 10,000 members. Camilla works with hundreds of volunteers throughout New Mexico and West Texas to protect, protect special places like the Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks and Albuquerque's Rio Grande Bosque, and to help curb global warming while stimulating the economy through renewable energy development. Fiebelman was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the Senate as a trustee on the Morris K. Udall and Stuart L. Udall Foundation in 2014. Camilla helped to found the Puerto Rico chapter of the Sierra Club, the organization's only Spanish-speaking chapter. She also worked to establish the Coalition for the Northeast Ecological Corridor. She continues to work as an advisor to the chapter and the coalition. Welcome, Camilla. Lastly, Johanna, Johanna Gilligan joined HomeWise in 2018. Johanna leads the organization's community development strategy to, get, to engage in strategic catalytic development projects focused on economic development, education, and health that foster re revitalization without displacement. These efforts increase the home ownership opportunities for residents, thereby ensuring that they participate in and benefit from redevelopment. They also focus on adaptive reuse and infill development, thereby making neighborhoods more walkable. Welcome, Johanna. I'm going to kick us off with a quick overview of the housing crisis and some recent research we at HomeWise have conducted on the carbon footprint of commuters to Santa Fe. New Mexico, like places throughout the US, is in the throes of a housing crisis. Over the last couple of decades, and particularly since the housing crash in 2008, home building, especially construction of affordable single family, uh, <clears throat> construction of affordable housing has not kept pace with demand. Add to that the limitations created by single family residential zoning and the extreme difficulty of citing affordable housing in virtually anyone's backyard, as well as res residential reshuffling attributable to COVID, labor shortages, and spikes in the price of building materials, and you have the makings of a perfect storm. Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and cities throughout the U.S. are many thousands of unit shorts, short of where they need to be in terms of housing supply. As a consequence, home prices in Santa Fe shot up over 50% in two years, and rents for newly leased apartments in Santa Fe are up 56% since 2020. Santa Fe's housing crisis is also contributing to climate change. Nearly 30% of jobs in Santa Fe are held by people who live outside the county. 
78% of workers who commute into Santa Fe travel alone and by car. And the picture you're looking at is a picture of West Albuquerque. This is not a picture of Santa Fe, but it's rather a picture of how West Albuquerque has grown through sprawl. Under the leadership of Governor Lujan Grisham, New Mexico has established ambitious climate goals that include a 45% reduction in CO2 equivalent by 2030. The city of Santa Fe's equally ambitious goals include carbon neutrality by 2040. Both the New Mexico Climate Strategy and the Sustainable Santa Fe Plan include reducing the distance traveled in signal occupant motor vehicles as strategies for achieving climate goals. Transportation is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the US and passenger vehicles are the largest single source of emissions within the transportation sector. Although remote work, increased utilization of ride sharing, public transportation, and more fuel efficient vehicles can help reduce commuting's carbon footprint, decreasing the number of miles New, Mexican drive, New Mexicans drive remains critical to reducing emissions and combating climate change. Making it possible for more people to live in close proximity to work, shopping, and services, and school is key to reducing New Mexico's automobile dependence. Although people commute for a variety of reasons, access to affordable housing is a major consideration for many. The median price of a single family home in Santa Fe currently exceeds $675,000. It is over twice that of Albuquerque. Housing justice and climate justice are inextricably linked. National research shows that due to rapidly escalating housing costs in job rich areas, the burden of living far from the workplace is increasingly borne by lower income workers and people of color. Equity demands that manageable commutes and walkable neighborhoods be available to all, not just those who can afford to live in downtown Santa Fe. Our estimate at HomeWise was that workers who commute to Santa Fe from outside the county generate over 300,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent each year. That's between 10 and 20% of the county's total greenhouse gas emissions. To reduce the carbon footprint of its employment base, Santa Fe must increase the supply of homes that are affordable to working families and close to jobs, amenities, and transit. This means increasing the density of housing through infill development, building on vacant parcels within existing municipal boundaries. Greenfield development, building new homes on inexpensive virgin land at the urban fringe, is a cheap way to produce housing that has grown the housing stock in places like West Albuquerque, but the costs that sprawl development impose on households and the environment are not sustainable. Not only does such development increase car dependence and the number of vehicle miles residents must travel, it also depletes the state's carbon sinks, those reserves of undeveloped land that help reduce atmospheric carbon by absorbing more carbon than they produce. Done right, housing development can play an important role in meeting those goals by increasing access to transportation and reducing the distances that residents must drive to work. Land use planning that prioritizes infill development and discourages urban sprawl will enable Santa Fe to meet both its climate goals and its need for affordable housing. So Camilla, can you talk a little bit about what climate change means for New Mexico and how worried we really should be? Thanks for that, Kelly. And once again, I'm Camilla Feibelman. I'm the director of the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club. I was born and raised here in Albuquerque. And I, over this summer, have been thinking about how to talk about climate change in a meaningful way. It really does affect every person in our state and the country and the world. And so at first I thought that maybe COVID is sort of a metaphor for climate change. But in some ways, we experience COVID and this particular pandemic in a really similar way. You know, we know that if we get vaccinated, um, we'll be safer. If we wear masks, we'll be safer. If we isolate at the height of the pandemic, um, that will, will help. And we know that these are sort of things that we can all do and experience in the same way. And yes, there are some ways in which specific communities are are more deeply impacted as with climate change, communities that are systemically underserved, individuals who suffer from inadequate health care, let's say. But overall, the problem and the solutions are easy to implement and recognize.
recognize and acknowledge it as something that we can each do. And we know that misinformation can keep people from accessing that information that keeps them safe. But in some ways, climate change is, is more diversely experienced. Um, and so it can make it hard, I think, for folks to understand when they're experiencing climate change. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're feeling that. One way here in Albuquerque is with a huge outbreak of a new mosquito uh, species in the area. People aren't going outside anymore. Um, temperatures are changing and inviting um, this new species in a way that really impacts us and makes life uncomfortable. But even more devastating were the impacts of climate-driven fires this summer that impacted every county in the entire state. And then ironically, we get our beloved monsoon when it results in just a sweeping away of topsoil for our communities. Um, so I know a lot of people felt that very personally, whether you were in Santa Fe breathing the bad air quality or whether you were part of a family that lost a generational home. Um, this week is particularly um, emotionally difficult, having spent 10 years in Puerto Rico, where over the weekend, the rains of Hurricane Fiona just have devastated the island. And there's no small irony that that happened five years after Hurricane Maria, which was preceded just 10 days before by Hurricane Irma. And some of those um, repairs and attempts to improve the grid are only just now getting, getting started. And maybe as far away as Pakistan, watching their monsoon season, which is normally a restoring life-giving time of year, was just a turbo monsoon that created untold amount of climate devastation. For me personally, the impact of climate change came in 2018 when a very serious hailstorm hit the southeast part of Albuquerque and our roof was utterly destroyed. The interior of our house was destroyed. Um, my husband, who is a green architect, viewed this as a chance to make some of the changes that we wanted to, like additional insulation and things that we could do to bring down our electric bill. But the reality was that more frequent and more severe hailstorms are a real symptom of climate change. But then, you know, when I list all of these terrible things that are going on, we know that that makes people feel stuck. It makes people feel scared and overwhelmed and not quite sure what to do. And so at the Sierra Club, we really believe in taking measurable uh, step action where you can kind of feel your own power to participate in change and work with others within your larger community to see that change tangibly and to really lead our elected leadership in helping bring in that change. So here in New Mexico, we've had a lot of successful action that the Sierra Club has worked on in close coalition with people like those on this call, whether that's Tammy at Sweep or Ona Porter, who's on with Prosperity Works. Um, we passed the Energy Transition Act, which attends to New Mexico's electric generation. And that bill helps us move away from coal sooner than we would otherwise, making it cheaper for customers, all while funding a, a just transition in the Four Corners area. And on that note, groups um, that participate in a convening called Power for New Mexico passed a Sustainable Economy Task Force bill, which helps us look at how to move away from our dependence on state income from oil and gas, which on the one hand pays for our schools, and on the other hand, drives global climate change and poor asthma driving um, air quality. So between that and the governor's executive order on climate, we've been able to cap or at least start capping abandoned wells that are spewing methane into the air, strong methane and ozone precursor rules, clean cars rules and stronger building codes. And all of that is meant to add up to doing our part in one small way here in New Mexico, where although we are small, we are driving a US oil boom in the Permian Basin. So I list the impacts of climate change, but I enlist you 
to join with us in these solutions that we think really can be made successfully with your help. Thanks, Kelly. Put myself on mute, apologies for that. <laughs> Thanks, Camilla. Um, Tammy, you've been right at the center of a number of important climate policy initiatives pertaining to both the built environment and the transportation sector. Can you help us understand how we got here? Why sprawl development has become so prevalent both here in New Mexico and nationally? Sure, thanks, Kelly. I, I think that in particular sprawl has come about because we've had decades of cheap gas um, and that's made the US lifestyle, which is very sprawl centric, very auto dependent, look and feel cheap. Um, and that cheap gas is brought to you by things like really cheap fossil fuel extraction on our public lands, um, lower fossil fuel taxes than any other country. Um, at various times, streamlined regulation for the oil and gas industry, which is not good. Um, and a willingness of the US to inter intervene internationally when fuel prices go up. That's the number one ex explanation of our international um, choices sometimes. So all those things together have made gasoline artificially cheap. And so couple that, you've got the past 70 years, we've spent almost all of our transportation dollars in this country on highways. So we've got more traffic, more pollution and sprawl. At the same time, we have underinvested and in some cases not invested at all in efficient low carbon transportation like biking and walking and transit. So in cities across the Southwest, we've actually prevented compact transportation efficient um, development patterns. And that's how we've got where we are today, where we are all dependent on vehicles and we have more pollution than we need. And we have people driving hours a day to get where they need to go. So, you know, it, it really comes down to those, those unneeded um, uh, pushes for cheap gasoline. I gotta unmute myself. Tammy, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the more notable um, accomplishments and, and perhaps disappointments around climate policy here in New Mexico? Sure. It's been a really exciting couple of years for policy. Um, I've been really proud of some of the things that we've been able to get done. And Camilla talked about some of the bigger picture. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the statewide things that I've been involved in. Um, most important for me is the Community Energy Efficiency Development Block Grant Act, the SEED Act. This has um, got a $10 million fund to it. We're hoping it will grow. And this is where local governments with state funding can go into the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, help the people with the highest energy burdens to reduce the energy burden in their home. These are folks that are precariously housed. So this in a lot of cases can actually keep people in their homes, which is the best way to keep, keep them um, out of this crisis that we're experiencing on housing. And so we can go into those homes and do whatever is needed for those homes to get them more efficient, reduce those utility bills. Um, another win recently on the building fronts was the Sustainable Building Tax Credit. And this is a tax credit for basically any building in the state of New Mexico. If you're building new or if you're retrofitting an existing building, these are commercial and residential, by the way, there is a tax credit for you if you are doing things like electrification, improving energy efficiency, making these homes more sustainable. Um, big failure on the front, um, on the state front was, you know, we've tried a couple times and we still have no benchmarking or building efficiency standards. Lots of other places do so that when you buy a home, you know what you're getting. Um, but we have not been able to get that um, passed a single committee <laughs> at the roundhouse. Um, on the local front, and I'll talk about uh, Albuquerque local front since I, I'm here in Albuquerque and I work on that, but we have passed some um, legislation to enable community energy efficiency projects like what's under seed, but with city money. Um, so we're, again, helping those low-income people who may be precariously housed stay in their homes. We just passed um, a new integrated development ordinance for the city of Albuquerque, and it had some really interesting provisions in there that, can, that could impact um, and create a reduction in sprawl. 
reduced parking requirements for commercial buildings. Like those kind of things are really important. Um, and then we had things like allowing motels and commercial buildings to be retrofit into affordable housing. Um, so that that's kind of exciting that we can kind of think outside the box and think of ways to create affordable housing um, that is less expensive and, of course, by definition, is infill. Um, failure on the local front, um, we, we just don't have a lot of traction on increased density in Albuquerque. And I think this is a problem that a lot of cities in our in our region are struggling with. Everyone wants a traditional single family home with a giant yard. And there's just not enough room for that. Um, so that's been that's been a struggle on the buildings front. I wanted to quickly talk about transportation wins as well, because we've had quite a few of those. One of the most exciting is the transportation electrification plans that are now required by all the electric utilities in the state, um, the investor-owned electric utilities, um, that can really jump start the market. Um, in these plans, they can do uh, things like offer incentives for public charging, offer an incentive for pub for private charging. It's at your home if you need to upgrade any electrical outlets to get that charging. Um, they can give you a rebate on a on the purchase of an EV. Um, they could offer lower rates for people who need to charge their EVs at night off peak. So those are really interesting proposals and they're, they're um, you know, different for each utility, but it's a really nice step towards getting the EV market moving. We also have a lot of work going on in terms of infrastructure. We spent the maximum amount available in the VW settlement funding for public infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, we also just got $38 million more million from the infrastructure federal bill that will be spent on filling in all those gaps. So the goal is to have every major road in the, in the state covered every 50 miles with a charging infrastructure. And as Camilla mentioned, we do have the clean car standards now, which is a really important step towards getting electric vehicles sold in the state of New Mexico. I'm not gonna talk about COVID because we've got all these supply chain issues, but pre-COVID, I tried to buy an electric vehicle, went to every dealership in town and couldn't find one because every manufacturer is selling, sending those vehicles to places that do have these clean car standards. And so now um, post COVID and with our clean car standards, we do expect to see um, electric vehicles available for sale here. Um, you know, just the one failure on the transportation front that I'll mention is that we have tried, and um, it's depressing to say, eight times to get an electric vehicle tax credit at the state level, and we still do not have that. Um, but overall, I think the policy work that's happening has the right combination of, of a focus on equity um, while trying to address climate change. I'm really proud of the work that we've gotten done in New Mexico and the path that we see moving forward. Great, thank, thank you so much, Tammy. So Johanna, you head up, um, you head up community development at HomeWise. Can you talk a little bit about um, about what sprawl versus infill development means for communities? Sure. Um, so first of all, it's really an honor to be on this panel with Camilla and Tammy and exciting to hear about all the great stuff we have going on at the state level. So my role as Senior Director of Community Development at HomeWise was really born out of this history of the organization's mission. So HomeWise is focused on enabling home ownership for people generally left behind. So for, you know, if you were going to walk into a bank tomorrow and get denied a mortgage, that's who HomeWise was created for. And we do that by integrating free financial coaching, and then the whole real estate process uh, for our borrowers. A um, little probably about 15 years ago, we started to do development because we were also finding that in Santa Fe, we would help people become ready to buy a home, but then there wouldn't be the affordable homes available to them. So we got into doing development and, and primarily did a lot of residential development that kind of models this suburban style home, home development. And I think, you know, several years ago, five or six, started, started paying more attention to the idea that homes alone do not create a neighborhood and, and began to take on strategies that were about mixed use development. We've always been focused on mixed income development. So we're bringing together homeowners from across an income background, but also started thinking about how we could, um, you know, add commercial uses to our buildings or, or other kind of outdoor spaces, whether those are bike trails or parks or things like that. Um, and also how we could you how we could get good information from the community about what they wanted to see in their neighborhood. 
So I think a lot of times in development, we overfocus on involving community voice at a single project scale, which tends to bring out people who oppose the project. And we under engage residents on big picture vision, right? And then giving those vi that vision as a directive to developers and to the market. So we're trying to test this out in the communities that we're working in where we do a broad surveying strategy. We understand what it is that people want, what amenities they feel are missing in their neighborhood. And then we integrate that into our plans. So the neighborhoods that we're working on are, um, in, in Barelas in Albuquerque and in what is sometimes referred to as the Silo Rufina Nexus in Santa Fe, they're both of neighborhoods where our, our homeownership offices are. And they're both centrally located neighborhoods. Um, Barelas in particular is 350 plus year old community that started as a crossing point on um, the, the river of the El Camino Real and is now smack dab in the middle of Albuquerque. So these are communities where there's really an opportunity to, to add you know, walkability to think about pedestrian access, to think about bike trails. And so as a developer, we're coming at that thinking about not just, um, you know, the experience of walking through a place is, is not just about how close something is. I live like a quarter of a mile from a grocery store, but I never walk there because to walk there, I would walk through blocks. Then I would cross the Rios road, which is six lanes of traffic. Then I would walk across a very deep parking lot. <laughs> and so it's not just about like how close things are. It's about what is the experience of walking? What am I seeing when I'm walking? How safe do I feel when I'm walking? Are there other people walking around? So in our work, we're really focused on a kind of multi-layered strategy that's bringing uses that people would want to walk to, for one thing, but is also, um, you know, incentivizing sense of place and creating opportunities for people to walk, maybe at nighttime when they might not feel comfortable walking before. So I think when we think about these development patterns and the role of developers in creating walkability, it's much more, there's a very important infrastructure piece, but it's actually also much more than that. It's about how many people live in a certain area. Is that sufficient number of people to support local businesses in that area? Do we have nice ways to walk? Is there sufficient shade? Are there coffee shops or other places to walk to? Can people walk to their job? Can they walk to where their kids are going to daycare? So we're trying to think about all of those things and put those pieces together when we work through this place-based approach. Terrific. That, thank you. Thank you, Johanna. I guess um, <clears throat> people are people are increasingly cognizant of the costs we as individuals and as a society pay for living far from where we work. And many people are trying to reduce the amount of time and money they spend on driving by moving closer to job centers. But not everybody has the means to live near their jobs and low income people are pushed further outside the urban core by gentrification, rapid escalation of home prices. Johanna, can you talk about the equity issues and particularly what this means for families? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think that the last several decades have really, in a lot of places, inspired people to move back to cities. Obviously, like New York is a great example. People were fleeing New York in the 70s and 80s, and it has since become a complete inverse where everyone wants to live in the city. And that has really pushed lower income folks to the suburbs or often to the exurbs in these communities. And then, um, you know, I think Santa Fe is a good example of this. Like the oldest parts of town is have become really the most desirable because they were developed before the car, because they're walkable, because they're higher density. So that makes for a very nice living experience. And that has really changed the demographics and to be very direct, like the racial makeup of those neighborhoods. And then what happens is that you have people within communities that then want those communities to stay exactly the way they are. So they want the, the, the community they moved to, to be the same community forever, um, which, you know, we actually have a lot of mechanisms that allow for this kind of pushback to be effective in our development processes. So um, often people who live in a neighborhood will be very involved in, in, you know, early neighborhood notification meetings or things like that, that are about new development projects that might be centering affordable housing, which might be really needed in that community, but could get slowed down or entirely derailed by people pushing back against those projects. Um, there's been a lot of interesting research on this nationally. Um, and I think what we're beginning to recognize is that um, we created a lot of community engagement processes in our development coming out of urban renewal, which was very understandable and very well-intentioned. Like we made a lot of bad decisions from a kind of singular planning, we know what's best mindset in the 60s and 70s. 
But we've now gone, I think, pretty far to the other side where we have um, really hyper local influence over whether or not projects get built. So um, that can look like, you know, people coming out against a, a project in, in an early neighborhood notification meeting and then that delaying or sometimes actually forcing a decision not to, to allow the entitlements to the developer to develop that project. And, and what we see in, in studies nationally, there's a book out called Neighborhood Defenders that's focused on Cambridge, Massachusetts and tracking people in, people's involvements in this process in Cambridge. It's often people who are wealthier, who are homeowners, who tend to be more, more often white that are really engaged in these processes. So it's like our, we have unintentionally, I think, created a process that is inequitable because the voices you hear from are people who already have a secure place in that community. They already own their own homes, who probably have more time and more ability to attend meetings and whose, whose voices and political clout can sometimes stop projects that would benefit a diffuse but broad range of people like, like an affordable housing project or like a higher density housing project. So I think we have these processes that are creating, that are furthering inequity in in our communities great great you make some excellent points um one of the one of the things i heard johanna is that more public transportation and affordable housing are things that people here in santa fe and in new mexico seem to agree that we really need but actually getting those projects done is super difficult as you know there seems to be a disconnect between the values folks espouse for society at large and what they're willing to accept in their own community I want to ask, um, I'm going to turn this question to Camilla. Um, you, can you talk to me a little, Camilla, about the work that the Sierra Club has done around planning and zoning reform to address these issues? Yeah, first, I do want to acknowledge one of the participants, Ken Hughes, who serves in our Northern Group chapter up in Santa Fe, but also on our national um, sprawl committee and transportation committee to understand how we can take comprehensive approaches to these issues. And, you know, one thing that I really want to sort of echo on that Johanna was talking about is just how these equity, these issues of equity have these spiraling effects, you know, that you help to drive the creation of a community that's walkable and close to jobs, which has the result of more people wanting to come and people who have more money available to them who then can buy other folks out. And although I don't know if it's something that HomeWise looks at, I do think that there's been some success in the community land trust approach, like we've seen at Sawmill, where you have uh, ownership of a home, but that goes back to the trust once you're willing to leave as a way of keeping housing prices reasonable for folks. And um, so looking at those creative solutions to ensure that community improvement doesn't mean suddenly being priced out of the place you've always lived and helped to improve. Um, the Sierra Club is celebrating the 20 year anniversary of our first sprawl report. And it's interesting to look back at the original report and then now um, some new infill guidelines that Sierra Club members and leaders all over the country have helped to develop. Um, but they are also in the process of looking for examples all around the country of where infill has really worked, not just for people who can afford to buy into it, but to create communities where people can live and stay. Um, I studied urban planning at the University of Puerto Rico, and one of the big things that we talked about was this idea that individuals should pull themselves up by the bootstraps to then be able to leave the community that raised them to go improve their life. But what would it look like from an urban planning standpoint if we created communities where people could stay and that were organic and meaningful to the people who have always lived there? And so I think that that's the big challenge. So I think our host has shared 
um, some of the articles um, that we think might be interesting to you looking at that kind of growing understanding of how to achieve urban planning that lets people stay and lets people benefit from the work that they've put into their communities. But the, the urban sprawl and infill program is actually looking for people to submit um, examples of where infill has worked. And so if you're interested in submitting something, you can see um, the link there. But I think ultimately we, we need to understand how every aspect of the way that we plan our lives as individuals and as governments impact climate change. And so there's the question of, can you live near where you work? And if you can't, is there a way to get there um, that's efficient and quick and comfortable? Um, for example, public transportation that works. So the city of Albuquerque, for example, is going through a deep analysis of, of um, bus routes. And that's going to hopefully help us better serve communities. Maybe we don't need to just trek up and down central for free. We could, you know, really make free fares, which is something that many of our partners have worked so hard for, get people from their home to their work, which is not always a straight line. Perfect. Thank you. Tammy, I'm going to ask you to switch hats for a moment and from your perspective and take on the perspective of a public official, which of course you are. <laughs> what can we do to better manage the tension between the broad public need for affordable housing and the rights of community members to have a say in the development issues that impact their communities? It's a very delicate balance, it seems. It is, and it's a really tough one. I think Johanna um, kind of laid this out perfectly. We have this this situation where um, our city processes, our state processes are set up for public engagement. Public engagement is really important. We have public meetings acts. We have all these requirements that are supposed to mean that everyone in our community has an input in every kind of meeting that our local officials and our state officials have. Um, but in reality, what we have is, is people who are at the higher economic scale, um, who are you know, working one job or retired, they have the time to go to these meetings. If you're working two jobs, um, you might not have time. If you're raising kids, you might not have time. And so we have this real inequity of um, participation in the public process. And that comes through in all of these land use issues. Um, I mean, it is really, really clear. Um, everyone, I'll use ex the example of Albuquerque again, because I'm here. Um, our integrated development ordinance has really clear guidelines for public participation. In fact, every neighborhood association has by default um, legal standing in all land use issues. And that, I like that. I like that we have a say in our community, but what that ends up being is um, people who look like me, um, people at the upper end of the economic scale are participating fully and we don't hear from others. And so we get to this point where um, one person's desire for you know, a single family expensive neighborhood um, does not actually trump someone else's right for affordable housing. And getting that to work in our process is really, really hard. Um, I'll give you an example. City of Albuquerque just recently redid our neighborhood association recognition, recognition ordinance because these folks do have automatic legal standing in all zoning and permitting and all of these things. And so one of the things in that new recognition ordinance that was very controversial was if you're going to be a recognized neighborhood association and you're going to have legal standing, in all of these land use issues, you can't charge people to be a member, to vote, right? Um, and that was very, very upsetting to a lot of folks. Um, but in my mind, paying to vote is never okay. Um, we also had folks, neighborhood associations that had rules like if you're a renter, you don't get to vote. You can't be a participant. Um, that is very undemocratic. And it has kind of led to the situation that we're at where the folks that are showing up um, and having an input are not representative of the entire community. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a move and there's a lot of conversations happening around how to make that um, public engagement process 
really relevant and accessible to everyone. And I don't have all the answers, but I know that we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, the the idea that everyone doesn't have equal access to their government and equal access to supporting um, whatever is important to them is very upsetting. And it really does, it is problematic. Um, you know, we have meetings, public meetings, and no one is there to say, yes, we like increased density. Yes, we think it's important that we have more affordable housing projects. Um, but there's a lot of folks there that are saying the opposite. And so I, I think really we're just going to have to, as government entities, figure out um, what we, we need to change locally to really invite participation from everyone. Can I add to that really quickly, Kelly? Absolutely. You know, I think I think that this is this just rings so true <laughs> from my experience. And a really good example of this is the Zia Station project in Santa Fe, which is a transit-oriented development project that was going to bring a mix of uses, is going to bring a mix of uses, residential and commercial, to a stop on the rail runner. So I think if we were all to take a step back, like a lot of people, if asked, would you like to see Santa Fe build more housing that increases access to housing and affordable housing and allows people to get right on the train and re reduces car use? They would say yes, they would say absolutely. However, this, this particular project that I think is a shining example of transit-oriented development has has met delay after delay because the neighbor association has opposed it. And it's now bound up in a um, in a legal battle. And this, this is like one example that you can just see a ripple effect of thousands of examples nationally. It's slowing down green energy projects. It's slowing down, you know, much, much needed housing, especially in ironically like blue states where, you know, we elect people who have these progressive values, but then when it comes to actually getting projects done, so more often than not, people are opposing them. And using, ironically, often like things like EPA regulations to oppose them. It's a really perverse <laughs> kind of modern day challenge that we're in. And so I, I think that um, I just I just think we need to help people understand that in our current moment, we have, for example, with housing in Santa Fe, we have a few options. We can build up, we can build out, or we cannot build housing. Those are the range of options we have. So we have to think about the best possible outcome for the majority of people within that context and for the environment within that context. And, um, and I think we need to figure out how to balance out the, the loud voices that are often opposing these things with the silent majority of people that would benefit from more affordable housing, but that are not showing up to, these, to the table. We really need to figure out how to foreground that missing voice in the conversation. Great, thank you. So I, I think we've done a really excellent job of characterizing the problem. So let's let's turn our turn our in the in our remaining time together. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. Um, and I'm just going to do this rapid fire. Camilla, what do you think? What's the solution or a solution? Oh, you make me go first. Sorry. It's to listen to Tammy and Johanna. <laughs> well, I think you know for the Sierra Club, the main sort of tool that we have is interpreting information to the public and helping them turn out in productive ways. And so I think, you know, we people have been driven by this fear of, oh, my property value, oh, uh, you know, whatever those sort of ghosts might be. And we really need to help people understand that when one aspect of our community does better, we all do better. And um, so I think that sort of my big solution is how do our organizations engage members of the public to help them understand the big picture and how um, creative infill um, planning for affordable housing and transportation is going to make our communities more vibrant, more productive for everyone and better for the climate. Great. Tammy, solution? Well, I guess my biggest solution is just get involved. Um, you know, we have in Albuquerque, we have the integrated development ordinance process, the annual update that's starting again next month. And um, I will say, all of the NIMBY, the, the not in my backyard folks are participating in that process fully. And so we need some yes in my backyard 
opposition to that pushback. Um, and so get involved with your local process, whatever it is at your local government. Simple. Call up your city councilor, your mayor, your county commissioner and say these words. I support affordable housing because we get a lot of emails and phone calls that they don't support it. But we're not hearing that there is support. I know there is, but we're not hearing that. So work through Sierra Club and all these organizations that are really there doing that, but also just reach out individually and get involved and say, I want affordable housing in my area. I want climate change to be a focus for this government entity. Um, and that would be huge and would really have a lasting impact. Terrific. Johanna, solution. You know, I think that enabling and incentivizing sensible climate responsive development that, that creates much more housing and much more mixed use development is really important. So, you know, in Santa Fe, that means updating the general plan, which hasn't been updated since 1999. Um, but it just means in general, broadly thinking like, not just how do we make this possible, but how do we incentivize it? What kind of tax credits can we provide? What kind of fast tracking of permits can we provide? We, you know, there's a lot of examples of this. There, there have been, there's been some major headway made in, in very suburban places like Arlington, Virginia. And they did a lot of that by reducing the barriers to, to developing you know, higher density mixed use projects along transit corridors. And they got out ahead of it and they thought about it holistically. So I think that's really important. I think another thing that's really important in our experience working on the development side is that there's sometimes a big distance between what the rules say and the rules might be somewhat ambiguous in their interpretation and how an individual staff person responds to those rules, which can just create a whole world of pain for these projects. So if there's any ambiguity, for example, in parking requirements, it may be that the person at the city staff is interpreting that in the most extreme scenario. Like, well, it says this range, so you have to do the most number of parking units. Those kind of individual decisions and those kind of staffing decisions, I mean, that is just like sand in the gears of everything. We need these things to move quickly. We need to, them to move smoothly. Um, you know, we need to build more housing. We just need to do that. And, and every way that that gets slowed down, slows down the opportunities for people to, you know, have a, an affordable mortgage rather than pay an extreme amount of rent for, for a low quality rental unit, for example, which I know is happening a lot in Santa Fe. So I think we have to look at this at the big level, but we have to also think about how do we operationalize this so there's some uniformity and developers can know what to expect because right now the risk is all borne by the developers. And so they're not, they're going to continue to develop sprawling, residential developments, if that's the thing that's easy to do, that they're going to get the least pushback on and that they're going to make the most money doing. They're not going to change that unless we have the appropriate incentives to do so. Great. Kelly, one thing just kind of popped into my head, partly because I uh, noticed that Representative Tara Lujan is on and she made a great point in the chat, which is, you know, it's one thing to get everybody housed, but it's another thing to make life efficient for people who are living in homes where maybe their electric bill is really high or their water usage is high. Um, and this is something that Tammy works on a lot, you know, where it's what is your utility burden? What percent of your income are you paying on these utilities? So we need to get these houses built, but we also need to be able to use the tools that Tammy's helped to bring over the finish line to make sure that people can live in a in affordable way, whether it's in an existing home or in a home that gets built. Um, you know, we'll see some builders say, oh, we couldn't possibly spend an additional $2,000 um, to make this home more efficient for you. And I'm thinking, well, wait, that's just gonna absorb into my, you know, 30 year mortgage and will be what, like a cent on each month that I pay where some of these technologies can reduce my monthly electric and water bills significantly. Um, you know, just the installation of 
over code insulation on our roof bumped our energy family bill down $10 a month. So I think really that's another solution that we've really got to implement and that's ready for us now. Our incentives coming from the IRA, the big bill that passed in DC last month, um, you know, incentives here at the state level to make sure that renters, new homeowners, and retrofits are getting the monetary incentives that are available. That's great, thank you. So we've come to that, that portion of the webinar uh, where we're turning to questions from the audience and we have gotten some pretty good ones, I have to say. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read a couple of these and, and uh, please, whoever feels you know, best equipped to answer them, uh, please do. So um, we have a question. I'm interested to learn about ways in which the growing recognition of the connection between climate change, transportation, and affordable housing in New Mexico has generated increased support and financial resources for affordable infill development. Anyone want to take that one? I'm interested to hear about that too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, Tammy, you mentioned the sustainable housing tax credit. Sounds like that's one, one approach. So I, I'll take a, sh a shot at that one. Um, so I think that, that the recognition that we have a sprawl situation that's driving people to driving people to drive um, back and forth all the time is really for, for the last couple of years, really gaining traction. People are starting to acknowledge that this is a problem. And I do think that is what um, was really behind um, quite a bit of those policy wins that I talked about earlier. Um, and I also think that the recognition that like Camilla was talking about with, with energy burdens for particularly our frontline communities, that is starting to kind of gain traction as well. And people are starting to understand that it's not just the price of housing it's the price of affording to operate that housing and so that's been the driving force behind seed behind the sustainable building tax credit um, and all of the conversations that we're having at the city level um, about like the, the new integrated development ordinance all of those changes that i was talking about that we were able to get through this year and that, that we want to do more of the increased density next year, I think those are all coming from this kind of conversation that's happening um, at all levels of government and, and throughout our community. So um, again, but again, it comes down to like reminding your elected officials that you know that this is a problem and you want a solution. Great, great. So here's another one. And it's a, this is an interesting question, talking a, a little bit about the demographic impact of, um, of lack of affordable housing. Um, so the question is, uh, since wealth is correlated with age, we have a shortage of kids and families here in Santa Fe. And that, that's pretty evident from the demographic data that you know, the percentage of children and families in Santa Fe is going down. Santa Fe is getting much older. Um, that leads to a spiral where smaller schools close, educational quality goes down, and there are fewer amenities and attractions for kids. As a result, families move out and fewer families move in, leading to a spiral. On top of housing costs, this has a big effect on economic development, recruitment of young professionals to Santa Fe. And so, I mean, I'm, I think I'm just going to speak a little bit to this one because I, it resonates with me. But, you know, one of the one of the issues, it seems to me, in having an affordable, vibrant community is having a really nice, diverse mix of not only ethnicities and races and lifestyles, but also ages, you know, um, and 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 certainly as a my my background personally is an as an economist and workforce is probably probably the single largest impediment to economic development here in New Mexico, to the extent that we, that our lack of affordable housing is forcing people to maybe leave Santa Fe, but maybe even leave the state in order to get a job and that, that provides, you know, that enables them to afford to buy a home is a really big economic deal. And I think that as we have these cross sort of, the, these conversations that really cross interest groups between housing and climate and transportation, it's really, really important that we keep in mind that the economy, our, our statewide economy that we all benefit from is, is going to live or die with our population and our ability to fill the jobs we wanna create. So um, I think that that, that was a great point um, about, about how housing 
and climate both speak to who stays in New Mexico and who leaves. Got another question here. Um, let's see. Um, oh, <laughs> let's see. Here, here's a, another question, and this one is asking, would it be helpful to collect detailed narratives of how affordable projects have been, been derailed recently, both in, in uh, Santa Fe and in Albuquerque, so that people understand exactly what the stakes are and how staff and neighborhood actions play a role, including reducing the density to the point where projects are no longer affordable or increasing financing costs through delays. And delays are, are certainly a, a primary tactic, I would say, of, of folks who are seeking to impede affordable housing development. Um, any, I mean, any thoughts on that, Camilla? I can say something about that. You know, it makes me, it's actually a great point and it makes me wanna go back to our sprawl team and say, hey, you know, maybe we need not just a list of the great projects that's worked out great, but some case studies of what can get in the way per what Johanna was saying. Um, but I also think that there's this interesting sort of um, counter alignment and two people in the questions have mentioned specific major sprawl projects in the state. You know, there's a proposal to increase pit production up in Los Alamos and house people in Rio Rancho. So what does that mean? And then you've got the Santalina project where, you know, there's a proposal to build 35,000 homes when we've got Mesa del Sol right down the road that has not even filled its capacity, much less the impacts on water, um, possible road and bridge building through you know, tribal and wilderness areas. Um, so I think it's important to look at what projects get moved quickly and why and how, what projects are not making it and why and how, and what can we learn from that? Kelly, I'll just add to that real quickly. If I, I, um, I, I learned this from Camilla, but it, it really does make a difference. Tell a story. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing these stories. I see the senior affordable housing unit that didn't get built because it wasn't approved because we would rather have single family homes. Um, I see the assisted care facility that didn't get built because it didn't get approved because people wanted it to be a commercial piece of real estate. Um, but I think if we could get those stories out to the public more, that would mean more um, if you can put a face on it and, and tell an actual story of someone who is literally now looking for housing unsuccessfully, um, you know, has a housing voucher, can't get it, um, can't find any place to move into. Those kind of stories really matter. So I love that idea. You know, and I would I would like to add on to that. Even though when you think about these big sprawl projects, particularly the ones that are you know in on, in West Albuquerque these days, one of the things you see is a really high degree of government subsidy. So it's not as though we're that we're, our policies are allowing this to happen, but we're actually our our tax dollars are going to pay developers to do this. Um, and and so it's 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 really a question of public policy too. Where where are what are we in really incentivizing when we create uh, tax increment for development districts that essentially allow sprawl developers to keep all of the revenue that's generated by their construction. So it's it's a you know it's a very multifaceted set of questions. And and I think every time we choose a low density development over a high density development, we're gutting our transportation our public transportation system. I think people don't always understand that you need sufficient density. You need a number of people living in an area in order for public transportation to work because otherwise you have to drive to public transportation which kind of defeats the purpose. So like, I think that we, we, we don't properly weigh the trade-offs often. You know, We only focus on the negative potential impact to a certain group of people when we're considering a new project. We don't think about the, the corollary negative things that that could happen if this doesn't happen you know so if this if this the station project doesn't go forward for whatever reason like they just give up what impact does that have on the rail runner for example you know so i think we need to get better at weighing the trade-offs and representing those one thing that i get really frustrated about is often the newspaper will cover these planning commission meetings and it just says neighborhoods oppose x you know, it's like, yes, 30 or 50 people came out to say that, but that is not the full story. So I think we've got to get a better, better handle on how we talk about um, not just the people that are opposing something, but the other side too. Got it. Excellent. So Tammy, one last question. We got, we got just one minute to go. 
will electric vehicles solve this problem? I mean, if, if everybody were to have an electric vehicle, we could we could drive really long distances, couldn't we? And and still not or reduce the climate impact. Well, if it were that simple, um, that would be great. But yes, I'm a big fan. I want everyone to have an electric vehicle. They are cheap to operate. I have an electric vehicle. I bought it for $11,000 used. I spend about $6 a month to charge it. I've spent about 25 bucks over the last 10, four, five years to replace the windshield wipers twice. I, apparently, I'm bad on windshield wipers. Um, but these are really cheap, um, effective modes of transportation. But that does not solve our sprawl issue and our climate change issue alone. Um, we're still, if everyone tomorrow drives an electric vehicle, we're still going to have pockets of people that are always the low income people living on out in the middle of nowhere, having to drive back and forth to their jobs, drive back and forth to, to fun, back and forth for shopping. And, you know, with the elect the ETA, uh, energy costs are going to go down and we're going to have renewable energy, but it's never going to be free. And so we're still going to have the cost impact of that sprawl and driving back and forth on those least able to pay for it. So we need electric vehicles, but we also need infill, infill development where people can live, work and play in one spot. That's the answer for an environment and for um, our low income neighbors. Terrific. Well, that's all the time we have today. I want to thank the panelists. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation, and I so appreciate your sharing your expertise with us and, and, and talking through some of these really important issues. The, uh, the, the, the recording of this webinar will be available sometime later today, and it will be available at homewise.org forward slash events. And I believe that that might even, there you go, it's right there on your screen. Um, so that's right at the bottom of the screen is where you can find a recording of this webinar. I wanna thank all of the participants once again, uh, Johanna, Tammy, uh, Camilla, you were excellent today and I really appreciated the conversation. I look forward to doing it again sometime soon. And thank you also to everyone who participated uh, by joining our webinar today. This is hopefully the first in a, in a long series of home wisdom webinars, and we really appreciate uh, your tuning in today. Thanks again. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you.